Advent is the season of the church year where we prepare our hearts. Uh, Not only do we prepare our hearts for the coming of Jesus at Christmas, but we prepare our hearts for the coming kingdom of our God, the eternal life that he's prepared for us. In this Advent season, we are going to look at the book of Isaiah and the prophecies that God has given to you and to me about the coming kingdom uh, of our God, the kingdom that has been established through the birth of our Savior Jesus. As we look at this coming kingdom, may God fill you with all hope, joy, and peace this Advent season. Today marks the start of the church year called Advent. Uh, It is from the Latin word Adventus, Adventus, and it means coming. And so we are preparing our hearts for what is coming. And immediately we probably think that uh, what is coming is Christmas, the birth of Jesus. And that is true. We prepare our hearts for the coming Messiah. But Advent is also the part of the church year where we focus on not just the coming of the Messiah, but the coming of the kingdom that the Messiah brings. And so for this Advent season, we are doing this series called Thy Kingdom Come. The kingdom that Jesus would usher into the world, we are wanting it to come not only in the world, but in our hearts. And we look forward to the day that that kingdom comes forever, where we get to be in that kingdom eternally. It's a kingdom that is a kingdom based on righteousness. It's a kingdom of peace. It's a kingdom of hope. And it's a kingdom of joy that Jesus brought to you and for you at his birth. And yet as we start this Advent season, maybe those things are not what you're feeling whatsoever. Maybe, instead of feeling hopeful, joyful, peaceful, you're feeling discouraged. Uh, You're feeling overwhelmed. You're feeling fearful at the state of the world. Maybe uh, you're feeling a little bit of despair uh, and hopelessness. Not only because of world events, but because of your own life. Maybe there are, are things that you've done that now you're facing the consequences of them, and will they ever get better? Maybe you're not feeling peace, joy, and hope as we start this season. Uh, Maybe it's your work, and it's overwhelming, and it just doesn't seem like it's ever going to end or get better. If this is how you're feeling, then you can relate to how the people felt in 750 B.C. Uh, God established the nation of Israel uh, to do one thing, two things actually, to bring the Savior into the world, but then also to be the nation that proclaimed God's word to the nations. Uh, God established Israel. He he built his temple in Jerusalem. He had Solomon build it around 950 B.C., and it was designed so that God's word would get out to the nations, so that the nations would know that the God of this world loves sinners and wants to be with sinners and has accomplished that very thing, that God could be with people. God established the nation of Israel for this purpose, and yet they had forgotten it. And in 750 B.C., if you looked around Israel, what did you see? You saw people who were terrified because their nation had been threatened. Uh, The Assyrians up north, who were masters at torture, were terrorizing Judah and Jerusalem down south by threatening to come down and overtake them. And if that wasn't bad enough, the people of Jerusalem looked, and their kings were incompetent, their kings accepted bribes, their kings lacked justice, And so there was all this injustice in the kingdom. Uh, They looked in the streets of Jerusalem, and what did they see? Morality tanking. They saw murder, theft. They saw all kinds of idolatry and things that they would never expect God's people to do. They did it. And this is 750 B.C. Just 200 years after King Solomon wrote his, his great book of wisdom that we just walked through the entire fall looking at, They had the book, 
and yet they lived like fools. As they looked around, there seemed to be no hope. They were frustrated. They were discouraged. They were filled with fear. How are things going to get better? And you know what the people did? Just like any of us do when we're looking for hope. They looked for all kinds of hope in all kinds of places. They turned from God to idolatry. And they went to idols. They even practiced divination, Satan worship, so that they could predict the future, see the future, so that they knew what was coming, so that they could be prepared. They looked for the next political leader and and actually supported coups and things like that to overthrow the king so that their person was king and in leadership. Because if he was king, then they'd be safe. They looked to build up the walls around Jerusalem because then they'd be safe. They looked to amass a whole bunch of gold and silver, which was plentiful in the kingdom. They looked all places except for where? The temple of God. The word of God. This was a context that Isaiah chapter 2 was written. And it's this context of political, social, cultural Uh, context that God sent Isaiah, the prophet, to Jerusalem. And he came with a message. He came with law. You have sinned. You've rejected your God. And he came with gospel. There's hope. It's in the midst of all this that Isaiah holds out hope for God's people. It's found in Isaiah chapter 2. He talks about the coming kingdom of God. Here's what we're told. This is what Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Quite the picture of hope, isn't it? Uh, Jerusalem, here's everything going on in in your world, and it's horrible. It's worth being filled with hopelessness over. And yet here's this vision of hope. Here's what is coming. And what is coming? The mountain of the Lord will be raised up in the last days. God's temple was built on Mount Zion, also known as Mount Moriah. Uh, And on that temple, or on that mountain was where the temple of the Lord was, and where the word of the Lord went out. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord will be raised up. Physically or spiritually? Probably spiritually. Uh, we, we're not really expecting Mount Zion to just magically start getting taller and taller and taller. Why? Well, because Jesus himself said that in John chapter 4. Uh, Jesus was talking to a, a woman at the well, a Samaritan woman, and she says, listen, Jesus... You Jews say that we have to worship the Lord uh, on the mountain in Jerusalem. Our descendants worship the Lord on this mountain in Samaria. And who's to say which one's right? And Jesus said, I tell you, a time is coming when you're not going to worship down there in Jerusalem on that mountain or on this mountain. But true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. In the last days... God's word will be elevated. The truth, God's church will be elevated to proclaim his word out to all the nations. And that started when Jesus died on the cross. From that moment, the gospel message has been ringing out to all nations and people are flocking to the church of God. And notice what the coming kingdom is going to look like. Notice the peace and the hope Many peoples are going to stream to it from all nations. People are going to say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord. Let's go 
and learn from God. Let him teach us his ways that we may walk in his path. There's going to be a hunger for God's truth. There's going to be, uh, there's going to be peace as nations no longer fight. As, as their weapons of war are turned into gardening tools. Because they won't need weapons of war. Because there's peace. And there's justice that happens. The Messiah will come and settle every dispute. There will be no injustice. Justice will be had. Peace will be had. And a hunger for God's word as many peoples will stream to God to learn from him. You want to talk about hope. As the people of Jerusalem looked around and saw nothing worth hoping for, God puts this vision out. Here's what's coming in the last times. Times change, people don't, right? 750 years later, or not 700, wow, no, 200, 2,750 years later, here we are, and the context is almost the same thing, isn't it? We look around and we feel discouraged. We look around and we feel frustrated. We, we look and we say, where, where is hope to be had? Because we see in the political arena, politics, politicians receive bribes. There's a lack of justice. We look around and we know what it's like to, for our country to be threatened by other nations and the terror that we feel inside. We, we look in our culture and in our country and we see morality going down. We look in our own household and, and, and we feel the, the discouragement. We feel uh, the fear. We feel all kinds of of inner turmoil over what is happening. And maybe we ourselves have done things and now we are facing the consequences for those actions. And we look and we say, where can hope be found? Where can hope be found? And you know what the temptation is? To do exactly what they did. To look to anything and everything but our God. What mountains are you trying to climb right now to bring you security and peace and hope? Are, are you amassing a, mount, a mountain of gold, a mountain of cash, thinking that that's going to bring you security and hope in this world and peace? Are you looking to the idols of this country, the idols of success? the idols of materialism, the idol of love. Where are you looking? Are, are you looking to that next politician that's going to write everything? The next politician that's, go, that's going to build this country back up where through their leadership, we're going to have security. Through their leadership, we're going to have prosperity. Through their leadership, everything will be okay. If so, do you know how God ends chapter 2. Stop putting your trust in mere humans. Our hope is not found in any of them. Our security is not found in any of that. Times change, people don't. But do you know what else changes? Times change, but God doesn't. This vision that Isaiah lays out for God's people is the same vision that God lays out for you and me. And it's your first point today. In the midst of despair, God's kingdom promises lasting hope for you and for me. Throughout Scripture, the Bible has many different pictures for heaven. And one of them is a mountain. We saw that in Revelation chapter 21 earlier, where the new Jerusalem, the mountain of God was raised up, and there is perfect security. The gates, we're, we're told the gates will never be closed because there's no threat. There, 
There's only peace. There's no war. Just like Isaiah says. There, every dispute will be settled because we have a God who carries out justice. There, all people will want to come and hear from God and learn from Him and be taught His ways because it's a delight to be with God, to hear from Him, and to be instructed by our God. This is a hope that Isaiah holds out to you. It's, this is a hope that God holds out to you. It's His kingdom that is yours. And it's His kingdom that He holds out in front of you, that this is what you have to look forward to. While everything else in this world seems to be going down the drain, we have this hope that will never end. It's a hope that was brought as Jesus was brought into this world for you. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what is causing you to despair or be discouraged. Uh, but you have this hope of eternal life with your God where it will be complete peace, complete joy, forever. In, in a lot of ways, we Christians can, can face this world in reality. We can admit it's going down. But we still have hope. And it's not a naive hope. It's not a crutch just to get us through. It's the hope of eternal life with our God. It's the kingdom that Jesus brought into this world. And it's the hope that you and I have. The eager expectation that this is how the world ends with us with God on the mountain of Jerusalem as we are with our God forever in complete peace and joy. It's yours. And it's the hope that we have. But how do we know? How do we know that this isn't just some naive hope that Isaiah held out before the people? Because honestly, when, when you think of their context, what doesn't it address? That Assyrian nation? God doesn't say, you're going to be okay from the Assyrians. In fact, 200 years after this, they weren't okay. The Babylonians came in and took them out. God doesn't say, hey, you're going to be okay, you're going to have good political leaders, you're going to be safe and secure in Jerusalem. He doesn't say that. This is hope for eternal life, and it's a hope that's still coming. So how do you and I know that this is a legitimate promise and a legitimate hope that you and I have to look forward to? The answer? Mountain peaks. For those of you who've been to the mountains, you know that as you drive, as you're in the distance and you see a mountain, you see one mountain peak, right? But as you get closer, you realize, oh, there's actually a second mountain peak behind it that I couldn't see from the distance. That's like Isaiah. Isaiah saw one mountain peak. He said, in the last days, here's what's going to happen. The Messiah's going to come, and God's kingdom's going to come, and it's going to end the world. One mountain peak. You and I know that that vision is two mountain peaks. That we're living between the two mountain peaks that Isaiah saw as one. The mountain peak of eternal life is ours. How do we know? Because we look back at the mountain peak that's already come. God has established his mountain as the highest mountain where the word of God goes out through Jesus Christ who was born into this world. And it's that mountain peak that we get to look back on to see God's promise fulfilled to know that that next one is ours. And as we look back, what do we see? We see God establish his mountain as the greatest mountain above every other rival. How? It was a mountain that wasn't Mount Moriah. It wasn't Mount Zion. It was established on a mountain outside of Jerusalem, Mount Golgotha, where Jesus, our Savior, was born into this world, not to mount a throne, but to mount a cross on Mount Golgotha for you and for me. Through his death on the cross, he has settled every dispute that God has with you so that we are at peace with him. Every sin that you and I have ever committed that God could wage war against us has been settled and we are at peace with our God. And it's through Jesus Christ and it's because of him that we know that that next mountain is ours. Jesus, who died and rose again, has opened the kingdom of hope for you and for me. Do you see why this is so important to look back? 
is because when we look back, we get to do something that Isaiah's people didn't get to do. We get to see just how much our God loves us. And we see it in a way that that the people of Jerusalem didn't see during their time. We see that God loves us, wants to be with us so much that he sent his one and only son to die for us, to settle every dispute so that we have the kingdom of hope to look forward to. As we prepare our hearts this Christmas, as we prepare our hearts to welcome Jesus into this world, we welcome the Savior who brought us that mountain peak, the kingdom of hope, who ushered in the kingdom of hope for you and for me. It's something that no politician, no amount of money, nothing in all of this world could possibly give you. It's the hope that only comes through Jesus. So no matter what you're going through, hold out that vision of hope, that kingdom that is yours, because that's how this ends. But how does it become ours? It's great that it's out there, How does this kingdom spread to our hearts and to others? Your second point today. God's kingdom of hope spreads through his word. If you notice, verse 3. Notice four times it talks about the word of God. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of God. He will teach us his ways that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. It is through the word of our God that this kingdom spreads. It is through the word of our God that this kingdom of hope spreads to us. As we look out in the world and it's filled with despair, where do we find hope? In the word of our God as he holds out this vision of the kingdom before us. If that is the case, how will that impact our December? As December gets filled, and I know many of you, your calendars are already packed, how will this impact our December? If the Word of God holds out the picture of hope for us, how will it impact you? How will it impact your expectations of what church is all about? How will it impact us as a church during this Christmas season and going forward? Let's be people who say, come. Let us go to the house of the Lord so we can hear the word of God. Let us be people who read their Bible because the word of God comes to us. The kingdom of hope comes to us. It spreads through the word. Let's be in the word. As you come to church, come expecting to hear the word of God. And and as we prepare services for you, we're going to prepare services that proclaim the word of God to you to hold out the kingdom of hope that is yours through Jesus Christ. This is what church is all about. This is what God's kingdom is all about. The spread of the word of God, the hope and joy that you and I have, the kingdom that you and I have to look forward to. And so come, let's go to the house of the Lord. Let's grow in the word of the God because through the word, he holds out that hope. And so even in times of despair, you and I have hope and joy and peace Because the kingdom has been brought to you, for you, through Jesus Christ our Savior, born on Christmas. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, uh, you know this world is filled with sin. Uh, It's been filled with sin since Adam and Eve first fell into sin. Uh, And it is a a world that is often so hopeless. uh, Because left to our own devices, humanity has really only destroyed what you have created. Uh, And yet, you don't leave us without hope. Uh, You continue to come and meet with us. You continue to bring us your word that's filled with hope, the hope of the kingdom to come, the hope that Jesus brought uh, through his first birth, or through his birth and his death and resurrection. We look forward to his second coming where he comes and we get to be with you forever on Mount Jerusalem where uh, there is no fear, there is no despair, there's only uh, hope seen faith seen. There's only joy and happiness and peace forever. We have a little bit of that joy and happiness and peace right now because as we live in this world, we know what is coming, that kingdom of hope where we get to be with you forever. Uh, As we get into this Christmas season, there are so many things that want to rival uh, the mountain of the Lord where your word goes out from, Uh, and yet we ask that you help us to uh, not run to them, but run to you, that we may grow in, in your word, 
that we may be filled with hope, with peace and joy forever. Be with us. Continue to fill us with hope uh, and fill us with all kinds of, uh, of uh, optimistic uh, attitudes, knowing that this kingdom of hope is ours. Help us to spread this message to more and more people that they too may have the hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for listening to this message today. It's my prayer that uh, it has changed your heart as you grew in the message of your Savior, Jesus. Again, if you wouldn't mind liking and subscribing, we'd be grateful for that. God bless your day.